Hello, and thank you for tuning into the Motherhood Village podcast, a podcast for mothers that want to expand their village, increase their knowledge, and build connections. Today's special guest is Lori Mahalik Levin. Lori believes in empowering working parents. She is the founder and CEO of Mindful Return, author of Back to Work After Baby, How to Plan and Navigate a Mindful Return from Maternity Leave, and co-host of the Parents at Work podcast. She is a mama to two wonderful redheaded boys, ages nine and 11, and is a healthcare lawyer in a private practice. Her thought leadership has been featured in publications, including Forbes, The Washington Post, New York Times Parenting, Thrive Global, and The Huffington Post. Lori, how are you this evening? It is really good to be here with you, Nikki. I am doing fine. I am awesome. resituating myself and I am good. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Before we dive into the meat and potatoes of all that, let's get into my icebreaker round. Yeah. What is your favorite book or one that you would like to recommend? I would recommend to pretty much every single working parent, Bridget Schulte's book, Overwhelmed, Work, Love, and Play When No One Has the Time. That mm-hmm. book, I mean, it affected me so much as a working parent in part because she, I mean, it's a very research-based book, but she quotes this evolutionary anthropologist named Sarah Blaffer Hurdy, mm. who talks about the fact that basically we've been engaging villages to care for our children and ourselves since the dawn of time. We've been engaging what she calls allo parents. Mm-hmm. You know, it was not true that like the women would stay with the kids and the men would all go off and hunt and whatever. No, the women were out there, too, and they would leave their kids back with the village to care for them. And so that thought that like, oh, my ancestors from thousands of years ago were working moms, too, really reassured yeah. me. Oh, that's awesome. Definitely sounds like an interesting read. Yeah. What are the values that guide you and your family? Mm, um, connection, authenticity, mm. I think openness about everything that the four of us are going yeah. through um, and just, you know, a willingness to to show up for each other in whatever state we're in. I love that. How has motherhood transformed you? I don't think there's much about my life that has not been transformed by motherhood, <laughs> but I'll pro- probably get on a soapbox about this later, but I am a better leader because I'm a mom. I know what to prioritize. I am willing to use my voice for things that matter to me and I think in my day, I can ground in my own values better because I have this other human being whose future or these two other human beings whose future I want to to make sure is a good one. Absolutely. <clears throat> so it takes a village to raise a child. So who has had the most impact on your life other than your parents and parental figures? And who is in your village now as you're raising your two boys? Yeah. Um, and when I thought about this question, the first thing that came to my mind was all of my music teachers growing up. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. I played piano and then violin and I was very involved in different orchestras and my violin teacher like my private teacher and my school orchestra director really sort of like took me under their wings and nurtured me even when I had you know struggles in my own home they were there Um, and so I think like my music teachers have been there for me and um, who is there now Um, I have two groups of moms who I am very, well, one is a group of moms and one is a a mixed group of people who are, some are moms and some are not. Um, The group of moms is a group called Hineni and we're Jewish moms and we get together once a month on a Saturday night. And the other group is a book club that's been together since 2004. And so we've literally been, you know, meeting through thick and thin through all of this. And it all comes back to the music because one of the members of my book club grew up playing cello and she and I have for years and years been saying, oh, we should get together and play chamber music. And and we had babies and like and then, you know, there was no time. And now we've started getting together to play violin and cello duets again. And so my village now includes music again, which makes me very happy. I love that kind of full yeah. circle moment. I love that. OK, so now we've kind of covered the icebreaker questions. Do you want to tell my audience maybe a little bit more about yourself? You could discuss hobbies. I know you have two boys, which is not 11, family life, yeah. whatever kind of whatever, you know, makes Lori happy in that aspect. And then we'll just discuss your journey into becoming an advocate for working mothers, you being a lawyer and author and all of that good stuff. Yeah. Oh, the, the hobbies and joy question. I love that. Um, so travel makes me happy and Mm -hmm. during covid that was not so um possible um but we did last summer manage to do a cross-country trip from washington dc where i live all the way to california and back um we went 8,153 miles in our minivan together and um 
I don't know if you know this, but the, the federal government has a program that allows all fourth graders and their families free access to all of the national parks. And so mm. this is an amazing opportunity if you have a fourth grader or when, you know, whoever's listening, mm -hmm. whenever they they have children in fourth grade to go and really explore these national wonders. And so um, we've sort of gotten hooked on car trips and on, you know, my husband and I met in France, although he's from New Jersey and I'm from Pennsylvania. So, you know, we have this sort of like international and travel bug in both of us. Um, so that makes me happy. My morning yoga makes me happy. I do yoga every morning on our screened in porch when it's possible to be outside for about 15 minutes. Reading books makes me happy. Um, strangely, going to amusement parks with my children also makes me happy. <laughs> Mainly awesome. because they're so freaking happy. They're so ridiculously yeah. happy and it's fun to yeah. watch them. Yeah. So I like how you're I like how you added that because I think sometimes, you know, we've gotten to this culture where we feel overwhelmed in those large tasks of like mm. the cross country. Like that's a big one with two boys and you know, um, especially at the age level that they're at or going to the amusement park. But I love how, you know, you finding the joy in that and saying, no, we're doing this together. Their happiness is my happiness. I would imagine a trip like that, seeing everything through their eyes of how yeah. excited they must have been to going that. So I love that perspective because I think we are inundated with seeing more overwhelm mm -hmm. with things yeah. as opposed to being like, yeah, it might be, but it's what brings me joy. And, you know, it. sometimes things you got to do it and it's what's necessary. It is, yeah. you know? Um, so I love that. So thank you for thank sharing you. that. And okay. I'll just also quickly say that they are nine Please. and 11 and that is an amazing like age to be able to yeah. travel because they still want to be with us. And I know that's not going to be the case in a couple of years and they're more self-sufficient. We don't have to take a travel crib or a stroller or all that stuff we sure. used to take. So like this is a sweet spot, I think for um, travel with kids. No, I agree. And I, I, I yeah, look, I'm all about the people that know me, that know me well, I'm all about finding that silver lining. And I think yeah. that's a silver lining to that, right? To your point, yeah, they might be young, but the they, the sweet spot of that is like, we don't have to bring diapers. We don't have to bring snacks. <laughs> They're self-sufficient. Yeah. They can have alone time. Like you could have those moments where yeah. they don't necessarily need you, need you, Every but they moment, still want to yeah. be near you. So that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Before we go into mindful return, which I love what you're doing with that. I love your mission with that. What inspired you to become a healthcare lawyer then entrepreneur, and then also <laughs> author, or if author came before entrepreneur, talk a little bit about that journey, if you, sure. if you will. Yeah, so um, I've always had a passion for public policy. And to mm. be honest, when I was growing up, I had this dream of becoming a doctor and then realized that like blood, gut, science, like none of these things were me. And so healthcare law sort of provided an opportunity for me to combine public policy and I sort of view it also as um, having a regulatory practice is like speaking a foreign language because you have to learn how to translate government regulations into English and explain them to your clients and show how they're going to work. And so sort of this passion for foreign languages and policy came together. And when I was um, in law school, I had the opportunity to do a summer associate position at a law firm. And at the law firm, I said, OK, I know I want a regulatory uh, role. So let me try out all the regulatory practices. And when you're a summer associate, you sort of get to dabble in different things. So I tried out um, energy and that wasn't really exciting to me. And I tried out telecom and it was all about regulating the <laughs> radio industry. And I was like, oh, this is not the future. And then I, um, you know, sort of fell into doing a little bit of work for the healthcare practice. And the practice was representing hospitals and academic <laughs> medical centers and health systems. Um, and it was just work that I could really feel passionate about and get get really behind. And so I sort of just followed that passion into a full-time job. I yeah. love that. And how long have you been practicing law? I'm sorry if you said the year. Oh, I graduated from law school in 2005. So wow. if we do math, we're going on 20 years. Yeah. Wow. Good for you. That's, that's, you. I love that. And, and you still practice that even though you have everything else going on, you still yeah. practice that. So Nikki, I like to say now that law is my side gig. It used to be the other way around that mindful return was my side gig, but now law mm -hmm. is. And about 20 to 30% of my professional work week is spent on my legal practice. Um, mm -hmm. I was a partner at Denton's, which is the world's largest law firm um, up until wow. last summer. And I left there to be able to focus more on mindful return. Um, and when I was at the firm, I was uh, first on a 60% schedule and then on a 50% schedule. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to leave. Um, and I, I now have my own firm and I do work in sort of a, a small portion of my week. Yeah. 
Sure. And I love how that's still something that it seems like you're passionate about. Yeah. Would you ever think about giving that up completely and focusing 100% on mindful return? Or do you still enjoy that aspect of what you do? Yeah, not right now. There's, um, uh, there, there are skill sets and like uses of my brain that I enjoy on the legal side that I don't get with that's mindful return. And there are so many wonderful things with mindful return, creativity and building community and all that, sure. that I don't get on the legal side. So I feel like they complement each other nicely. And at yeah. this point, um, you know, there's a particular niche within a niche within a niche of yeah. helping new teaching hospitals to start residency mm -hmm. programs that like I really love. And I feel like we're contributing to making sure that we don't have a physician shortage in the future and sure. all that sort of, so, so I can get fired up about that too. So no, I I, I'm that. happy doing both. Yes. I love that. I love that. And I know you are such a um, advocate for working for working parents. So we'll get into that. So yeah. what is the mindful return? Talk about the inspiration behind creating it. And then obviously also the creation of your book. Yeah. So I guess rewind to a time when I was working full time in house at a healthcare trade association. It was the Association mm -hmm. of American Medical Colleges, and I had my two boys. And I returned to work full time after each of them, after you know a standard American maternity leave. And I wound up with Mindful Return ultimately creating what I wished had existed for myself. Mm -hmm. I looked around whenever I went back to work after having my babies, and I said you know, well, what will help me with this transition back from parental leave? And all I could find at the time were snarky resources that told me not to put a photo of my baby on my desk or that I might leak on my shirt. And I did not find any of this helpful. And I looked around and I could find courses and resources on pretty much like everything related to my baby. And that's wonderful. And we need baby focused resources. But there was so little related to my own personal and professional identity transition that happened whenever I became a working parent. And so I looked around for a community to join and a group and a class and whatever, and I came up totally short. And um, at the same time, I had parent after parent at my organization coming into my office, shutting the door, those moms, bursting into tears, saying like, this is so hard and nobody's talking about it. Yeah. So the first thing that I did was to start a working parent group at my organization. And we started meeting monthly just for like brown bag lunches, very informal. And then I looked around and I said, this is a much bigger problem than just my organization. Mm -hmm. um, and my husband is an entrepreneur and I am a risk averse lawyer. So my thought was never, oh, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. No, but he is a career coach and like went to business school, has his MBA and all that. And he looked at me and he said, <clears throat> you know, like if there needs to be something out there, like why aren't Great. you, <laughs> what are you going to do about this problem? Essentially was his um his push for me. And so I sat and decided that I wanted to create an online cohort based course. Um, mm -hmm. Because when I was a really desperate new mom of two small people in a dark place, crying every mm -hmm. night on the kitchen floor, I joined a cohort based uh, group for new parents. So, you know, I love what you're doing about bringing moms together and making sure that they're creating this village because we need that. Mm -hmm. um, and I took an online course designed for parents of, you know, this course was for all ages of kids and it was called the Abundant Mom Mama Project. And I can I felt connected to all these other people all over the globe who couldn't get the Cheerios off the floor in their house either. And they couldn't, you know, everything was yeah. um, challenging. And I felt so much less alone. And I said, gosh, like we really need a program, a course for people in that transition back to work after parental leave mm -hmm. where they can feel seen and feel heard and know that they're not having, you know, the thoughts in their head are not the only, they're not the only ones having them. So I started writing the Mindful Return course. Um, you know, it was sort of a, a, like 20 minutes a day chunk because I was working full time. I had a an infant and a two year old. And so it was literally 15 and 20 minutes at a time. Whenever I had a work trip, I would like savor the like two or three hours on an airplane when I was alone to like dig into this. And I started blogging and like after a couple of years, you know, the courses were up and running and I sure. looked back at my blogs and said, heck, I think I've already written a book between blogging all this time. <laughs> and so I wove the blogs all together and created um, the book Back to Work After Baby. So oh anyway, that's the that's the story. And then I, I was working full time at this trade association. And after about a year and a half of doing both where Mindful Return was my side gig, mm -hmm. I left and went to the law firm and started that partnership role on a 60% schedule so I could spend some of my daylight hours working on yeah. Mindful Return. Yeah. And tell me, um, and usually I say this through the end, but tell me some of the services um, um, that Mindful Return 
provides before we get into some other questions regarding parental leave and all of that. Right, right. So the main program, which individuals can sign up for, or there are, I think we're at 89 employers that offer it as a parental leave benefit. Um, It's a four week long cohort based program. There's one for new moms and there's one for new dads that help them through the transition back to work after leave. Most people take it like while they're actually out on leave and it connects them with other people who are all going through it at the same time. It happens every other month. So it like coincides with people's parental leaves in a good way. And um, we have expanded it um, in a number of ways. One, we have a program specifically for parents of special needs children mm-hmm. of any age who are trying to juggle sort of career and yeah. um and all of the needs that they have. Um, Mm -hmm. We've gone and created a UK chapter of Mindful Return, um, a South Africa chapter, an India chapter. We've translated into Spanish. So now we have a Spanish language version of the mom and the dad courses. Um, We're about to launch Portuguese this fall. And what else? What else? We now also, because we've had thousands of people go through this course by now, um, the alumni came and said, okay, we went back after parental leave and we're working and now we have toddlers and we have school-age kids and we still need help. So we created a program called Mindful Return 201, which is a four-week program that brings working parents together to work on time management, self-care, community building, and their careers. And so, you know, we've sort of evolved over time in creating programs that meet the needs of the people who we're serving. But it's mostly an online cohort-based program for new parents. Love it. Um... And throughout this, because it, this has been years now, right? Because eight years, yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's amazing. Thank you. Um, I, it's crazy because I always say you don't know what you don't know. My son is four years old, and I had no clue where to start, which is why yeah. I love having this conversation with you because. I, you know, there's things that we don't know still, right? You would think mm-hmm. like at this point, like how did so many people not know about your course? How can people not get connected <laughs> with you? My son was born four years ago and I didn't have anything. Yeah. Um, and it it spiraled downhill where I left a company that I was the um, vice president of finance and HR. Mm. I had no clue what I was doing, although I thought I'd be prepared because here I am this executive and I'm like, I got this. And then my Mm -hmm. son is born and I had no clue whatsoever. I didn't, Mm. I didn't expect the separation anxiety. I didn't expect the postpartum anxiety. I didn't Mm -hmm. expect everything that came with it. um, The overwhelm. And then in trying to express that to my employer, of course, my employer didn't have any programs, but I say Mm. all that to express to you that these conversations are so important to continue to put that out there, to know that there are resources. Mm. Um, So that's amazing that you've been doing this for eight years. Since going through all of this now, um, what can you say or how can individuals, um, uh, individual parents navigate a more calm and successful parental leave? What are some high level tips that you can say in during all this that really are the things that you should be doing? Yeah. So first, thank you for putting the emphasis on individual. I want to sort of give a nod to all Mm. of the structural problems that make it a really crappy world for working parents to enter into, whether it's on the paid leave front or discrimination or like bias and all that stuff. So we'll put that to the side for a moment and we'll say that there are things that individuals can do to feel better in their transition and their return and their day. And all of the mindful return programs focus on four themes that I truly and deeply believe help to make a transition more successful. And there are themes mm-hmm. that I wished I had focused on. So maybe I'll just give one tip in each of the four buckets sure. or something like that. That works. So the four buckets are um, a mindful mindset, logistics, mm-hmm. leadership, and community. So if we do one tip for a new working parent in each of those buckets, um, the mindful mindset piece I have like a million different tips, but one of them (laughs) is don't underestimate that micro mindfulness, the micro self-care in your days, your early days as a a working Mm -hmm. parent. When you are in the shower, for example, use that moment to pause and feel the hot water and set an intention for your day. Um, Mm -hmm. Whenever I was a new parent, I came up with this acronym because I could never remember to do this in the shower or whenever, but I came up with, with an acronym, ISS. The I stands for set an intention. The first S stands for stretch and the second S stands for savor. And I would just do this in the shower every morning, just a way to like ground yourself and say, I'm alone. No one is attached to my body right now. And my intention might be go to bed at 9 p.m. tonight because I'm exhausted. Or the intention might be just to repeat the mantra, I am enough today. Okay, so that's mindset. Uh, Logistics, to the extent 
you can phase into and out of things around parental mm -hmm. leave. I'm a huge fan of that concept. If you can phase your baby into childcare, for example, the week before you start at work, it gives you some of that mental space to be able to get some of the tears out before you go back, for example, to go like find clothes to wear and get a haircut and all that good stuff. Um, yeah. And if you can transition, if your employer is one that will allow you a phase in on the way back in, I think that's a really wonderful uh, way to go as well. Um, leadership is the third bucket. We don't talk enough in this country or in the world about the amazing skills that parents get through leadership, uh, sorry, that parents get through parenting that are amazing leadership skills that make them good at their careers. So yeah. if you are a new parent, my challenge to you is to sit down and make a list of the things on a post-it note of the things that you are now better at because you are a parent that are also applicable to your job. I mean, maybe it's prioritization. Maybe it's the ability to meet the needs of demanding clients who can't articulate their needs very clearly. It's <laughs> any of these things, right? Empathy, yes. the connection. These are all things that companies pay bazillions of dollars to train as leadership. And we need to claim that and say, we have these skills. So that's leadership. Put, put that on and call yourself a leader and remind yourself that you are one. Love it. Then the fourth piece is building community and not isolating yourself on the kitchen floor like I did for way too long. Um, if you have a working parent group at your organization, join it, find out what they're doing. If there isn't a group, think of convening one. I know when you're a brand new parent, it's hard to think of like putting some organizational thing on your calendar, but maybe in six months, maybe in nine months. Um, I'm a serial founder of working parent groups, um, both at the trade association where I worked and at the law firm. And I've since convened a group called the um, Working Parent Group Network, which is about, mm -hmm. at this point, about 230 leaders of working parent and caregiver groups across the country. Mm -hmm. So feel free to join us if you are the leader of one of these groups. But um, it can, these okay. groups, I think, and just connecting with other working parents in your office can be wonderful ways of normalizing being a working parent. They can also be really wonderful business development opportunities. I got business by going to the working parent meeting. You know, I have a, a colleague who likes to say that the the playground is the new golf, the golf course, is, no, the playground is the new golf course is how she puts it, right? Like there are great networking opportunities there. So, you know, on your first day back from parental leave, go have lunch with another fellow working parent at your office. Make sure you're connecting with those other people and thinking that you're not trying to do it alone. I love that. Um, I love the mindset piece. I love the, setting the intention. I think sometimes it is just shifting the mindset, I think for so long, and I love the leadership aspect actually. Mm -hmm. But let me let me touch on that before we move on to the next question, because I think mm -hmm. for so long we're told as working parents um, that or, you know, you hear that if you've been a stay at home mom um, out of the workforce for however long, that if you jump back in, like you don't have any skill set. So you have to. And to your point, it's Loney. like, oh, no, you have to manage <laughs> schedules you have to manage um demanding schedules demanding people to your point that can't articulate their needs and trying to figure out especially if you have more than one i only have one lord i can only imagine multiples yeah. if you're a single parent there's so mm -hmm. many different levels um that parenthood because let's not forget the dads as well mm -hmm. um that en encompasses that so i think that's so powerful and something that does need to be talked about and, and normalized more um, what can employers do to support mm -hmm. new parents through this time of transition? To me, I think that that's key. One of my things that I do professionally as a consultant, um, I'm a big employee advocate and mm -hmm. trying to talk to, especially to those small business owners that think it costs a lot of money or sometimes it doesn't cost any money at all. Sometimes someone just wants a pat on the back. So yes. speak on your things yeah. that you're like, that the little things that can make or, or have a huge impact. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for raising that issue. There are so many things employers can do. I mean, uh, at the the base is really a, the mindset issue. It's the believing in the employee for the long haul, knowing that this yes. is just a blip in a very long career yes. and remembering that losing them means that institutional knowledge and a potentially very dedicated employee are walking out the door. So Yes. Um, I think believing in the employee, making sure that you are paying attention to the transition, like knowing when they're planning to go out and helping provide them with some tools to do so, you know, making sure that they have like a template parental leave plan that they can like fill out and list out their projects and talk through it with their manager. Mm -hmm. um, manager training is a huge one. I mean, yes. manage, a lot of managers are another. uncomfortable about talking about leave and don't handle it well. Um 
you know, so really that that belief piece, having flexibility around the transition in and out is huge. Mm -hmm. um, reminding employees that anyone could have to go out for family leave for any reason. So it doesn't become mm -hmm. a parent issue. It becomes a caregiver issue. And we know that a majority of people in this country are caregivers and have to go through this at some, some point. Capacity. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are training programs like Mindful Return, obviously, that can help people yeah. go through the transition. Um, you know, adopting gender neutral um, parental leave policies that do not distinguish between primary and secondary caregiver, for example, mm -hmm. is a big one of, you know, making sure that you are sure. leveling the playing field for all caregivers. Um, also, making sure that you're following up with the person who has transitioned back a few times after they come back, not just like the first day in the first week, because we know that that first week can be hard. But guess what? The transition back to work after parental leave is a process, and I would even call it a year-long process. Yeah. It is not just an event that takes place and suddenly, oh, okay, everything's back to normal. So yep. I'd say like build check-ins into mm -hmm. the the return process. You can come up with a mentoring program. It doesn't cost any. Well, it costs a little bit of like time, time and, and you know admin yeah. resources, but you know pairing people up with people who have been through it can help them to feel less alone. Supporting people's efforts to start affinity groups and ERGs around parenthood and caregiving and giving them some FTE time to do that um, is something yes. employers can do. I could go on and on. I have a long list for employers, but those are some of the the highlights, I think. I love it. And um, in the show notes, I'll put how people can connect with you. And you can also mention sure. here, but definitely whoever's listening to this, you can follow her on LinkedIn. You give so many good, great resources there and Thank tips you. that you discuss. Um, what are some changes that you believe will move the needle in terms of having more women in leadership positions and how important do you think that will be in moving a lot of this forward and quickly? <laughs> I don't know about quickly, Nikki. But... Well, well, quicker, <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to yeah. go a little maybe wild here and say that the way that, for my, to my mind, the best mm -hmm. way to move women forward in the workplace is to uh, normalize caregiving for everyone. Um, you know, talking about paternity leave as much as you're talking about maternity leave, asking a, a new dad who you know is about to have a baby, when are you going on leave? Not, are you going to go on leave? You know, just even that, that wording change mm -hmm. helps normalize things. And I would advocate, and I sort of get on a soapbox frequently about this, but that we need to start this conversation about everyone being a caregiver much, much, much earlier in our kids' lives. So if you have parent helpers or babysitters who come to your home, my challenge to you in the interest of furthering women's careers is to make sure that your babysitting bench does not consist entirely of all girls. Now, this is why I'm saying this is slow, right? This is slow change, but I have an 11 year old. He's doing parent, like a parent helper gig that makes him so excited. And most people say, oh, I don't, I don't have boys as babysitters. No. Why is that? Is it because we don't think that they can be caregivers, right? And yeah. so if we are programmed later oh, in life so to powerful. think, yeah. to associate mom and child, like, oh, you think you think about a child, automatically you think about the mom, you don't think about the dad. We have to rewind and program a lot earlier the idea that like dad can be the caregiver too. Dad is in equally interested in being the caregiver and stop shaming dads for being caregivers in the workplace. So I'll stop there. Oh my God, no, but that's so powerful to even have that mindset shift because it's so true. I think we're so ingrained to think, like you said, the minute we think of woman, the minute we think of girl, the minute we think of teenager, what's the first job? Go babysit. Mm -hmm. You want to make mm -hmm. quick bucks? Go babysit. Where yeah. it's like, but well, why can't my son, your boys at some level to say, oh, well, you know, too, you can watch my niece, for instance, or cousins yeah. and stuff. Yes. Why is it so ingrained to think? Because then truthfully, yeah, we're already, we're already studying the status quo in that that maybe when they do get older, that they then don't have that connection of thinking what it is. Um, oh, that's so, so powerful. So I, yes, I see why you said not, maybe not so quickly, because that's a big <laughs> mindset shift. Generational but, too. But yeah. it is. Oh, yes. Very generational. But it's such a, a major, major point. Um, and I think something that can challenge all of the listeners that are, will eventually listen to this episode mm. and say, wow, you know, yeah, like that's, that's so powerful. How do we look at that? How do we have the conversations of having a babysitter? Truthfully, in my mind, when I when I've seen, you know, men counselors or things, you might mm -hmm. pause and be like, wait, what? But you know, what are we saying that men are only good for sports? And, you know, those rough as opposed to they can't be compassionate, they can't be empathetic, where it's like, no, my husband is all of those things, you know, yes. thankfully, even though he maybe not have modeled it growing up, but 
no, they can also be, you know, my husband wanted to take, he took off a month of unpaid leave to be home mm -hmm. with our son, thank God, you know, let's normalize it. So I love that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. You have the guide, 99 questions to ask yes. yourself before, during, and after parental leave. I know it's something that people can download, correct? Absolutely. It... Yeah. If you just go to mindfulreturn.com, you can grab your copy there. Mm -hmm. um, get, can you give a few examples of from the guide, anything that you feel like is worth sticking out and something that you want to mention here? Yeah, so the guide actually works through those four buckets of mindset, oh, logistics, leadership, and community and does it for three different sets of time, right? Before you go out on leave, while you're actually out on leave, and whenever you're coming back from leave. So it's structured in the same way that all of our programs are. And there okay. are threads throughout, right? So in the mindset piece, while you're pregnant and you have a little bit more time on your hands, perhaps if you don't have other kids, um, <laughs> then that's a time when you can start establishing the mindfulness habits that are going to serve you super well once you have a baby and then you go back to work and you've got all these other things on your plate. So I think getting into the rhythm and the habit of thinking through some of these things even before your baby arrives can be really helpful to your mindset whenever you have the baby and know, okay, I need to be focusing on my own mental health and taking pauses in my day because I learned how to do this when I was pregnant. Sure. Uh, before we kind of finalize here, I do have a couple other questions because you had mentioned earlier that you now have parents come to you like, okay, well, what about the next phase? Okay, we did parental yeah. leave, we're coming back from baby, now we have toddlers. What about the stage of parenthood that you and your husband are in where you have a nine and 10 year old, you're hitting double digits, it's social media, what are some challenges and things that you're facing as a mom? How do I navigate that? What are some things that you're looking for your own resource to look into now that you have a nine and a 10 year old? Yeah, yeah, they are nine and 11. So we're like, or nine and 11. Yes. That's even, yes. And um, the first thing I'll say is I'll just put a plug in for Cara Natterson's wonderful book called Decoding Boys. And it mm -hmm. is all about that teen tween years. And I mean, I learned that the average on the average age of onset of puberty in boys in the United States is nine. So, you know, like we need to start reading this stuff a little bit earlier was basically what it taught me. I mean, the challenge is, gosh, um, it's true that I think that the problems do um, become fewer. Like we have a 32 problems in an hour when you have an infant, right? But So they become fewer now, but they become a little bit more serious, right? So, I mean, the pandemic was a huge deal. We had our boys home with us for 15 straight months because school was closed. And, um, you know, they were doing remote school. And for us, it was really questions around mental health and socializing and social emotional stuff. And, you know, uh, without sharing, you know, a lot sure. of personal details. One of my sons um, had sort of a disagreement with one of his friends pre-pandemic that never got resolved during the pandemic. And then they returned to school and they were mad at each other and they didn't even remember why. And so, you know, we mm -hmm. engaged the school counselor who was able to like bring them together and talk and sure. like realize that it was a complete misunderstanding from two years ago. And I think, you know, um, we've had to rely on the resources of school counselor and the teachers yeah. to help with the social emotional stuff. Um, I mean, technology devices were all in the midst of that. I'm reading a book right now <laughs> called Parenting in the Age of Attention Snatchers, right? Which is exactly like, how do we get our kids to deepen their voluntary attention skills? Because the involuntary attention is you know being captured right. all the time. Um, my yeah. oldest son is about to go off to middle school next year. And he's going to walk himself to school. And this is like a totally new thing, right? And so we're going to get him a gizmo watch. We're not ready to bite the bullet and go get him a phone yet because we don't want him on social media and whatever. But like, yeah. we're, you know, researching options. What are the safe ways of keeping track yeah. of our son? And um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll just throw out there like fifth grade, he had sex ed two weeks ago. So there were lots of questions mm -hmm. that came out of that. So we've got mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of different changes and a new phase happening. It's exciting. It's really wonderful. He, my oldest son walked to a birthday party three blocks from our house all by himself a couple of weeks ago. And it was the That's... first time he had ever you know, gone off and done that. And I was like, Oh my gosh, should I follow him? And I didn't, I stayed home and was like, yeah. Oh my gosh, that gives me time. Like, Oh, I just got this window. That's what so, we did growing up. Right. Yeah, That's what we did. Yeah. I, went, I would ride my bike for like hours. I mean, granted, it is a different time. It is. Mm -hmm. And there are certain mm -hmm. things for sure. And I believe in open conversation. And I know you stated that as one of your values. And I agree. I think openness yeah. is so important from A to Z and trying to talk about it all and yeah. hoping truly that the openness will have an impact um, because I think they just need to know. That's how I was raised. And I'm thankful for that. My parents didn't really, you know, obviously age appropriate, but they mm -hmm. shared things with me. So I think you got to hope and pray that you sharing that, like, don't talk to strangers and, the, and you know, the importance of this. But it's what we did, right? Yeah. It's what you did. Yeah. And, you know, you have to believe that, you know, 
you just have to believe that it's okay that you know it's right there that they're good you know but yeah I was just interested because I'm like gosh you know I know you spent so much time with this and it's something you're such an advocate for but you are also in a stage of motherhood that you've never been in right (laughs) goodness even with my son being four things have changed like it's Mm -hmm. crazy so okay what's next I know you mentioned mindful return you are you know um, other languages which is amazing and other courses but anything else maybe you want to share or how people can just connect with you and then any other final thoughts to the podcast community wonderful yeah no thank you so much for having me on and giving me this opportunity to share um so I have had for a while now a goal of having a hundred employers use mindful return as a parental leave benefit and we're at 89 and so close so like i just that's the sort of like next goal that i want to reach um i'm really excited about the international growth and just discovering that we have so much more in common around a transition back to work after parental leave than we have that separates us as humans um you know whether you had three weeks three months or a whole year off that transition back after your baby is hard no matter when you do it right so I'm really interested in you know bringing that message um, to a broader community. Um, folks can reach me. Um, I mean, I'm on uh, Mindful Return is on all the social media channels. So please go over to Instagram and follow us there. We do. Uh, I do a personal Tuesday tip for working parents on there every week. Um, you can go to our website mindfulreturn.com and get the 99 questions to ask yourself document. You can feel free to link in with me and mention that you heard me on this podcast and I will accept the LinkedIn invitation. Um, I co-host a podcast with my husband actually called Parents at Work. Um, oh yeah, you can I talk about that. If you want to talk about that for a, a minute or two, please yeah. talk about that. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's called the Parents at Work podcast. I originally co-hosted it with a wonderful fellow lawyer named Tom Spiegel. And during the pandemic, Tom had to run his law firm and sort of exited the, the um, <laughs> podcast world. But uh, my husband, Jason Levin, and I co-host this podcast, and we interview um, two moms and then two dads in a particular industry or role. So we'll do moms and dads in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion was our most recent one. Moms and dads in law, moms and dads in accounting, moms and dads in HR. And we love being able to cross-pollinate ideas across industries and across sectors and how working parents you know, can thrive and and share resources. Um, What else? Oh, my last message for working parents. I think it's really a message of self-compassion. It's you are doing fine. If you are listening to this podcast, you care. (laughs) If you are listening to this podcast, you're doing a great job. You are, you're going to be fine. Your kids are going to be fine. I think um, the you do you concept and my favorite, favorite mantra and quote is Teddy Roosevelt's comparison is the thief of joy. Like tune it all out, do your thing, you know what you're doing and just like ignore the noise. So you you got this, whether you're a mom or dad, you got this. I love that. Thank you so much, Lori, for coming on, for sharing your story, for sharing some wonderful tips with us and continued blessings to you for love and light. Thank you. It was a pleasure to, to have this conversation with you, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this impactful episode of the Motherhood Village podcast. Subscribe to my show so you'll never miss a future episode. You may also rate and review on Apple Podcasts and share this episode with someone that can use it as part of their motherhood village. Remember, your village can take up many forms and you do not have to do it alone. Connect with me at themotherhoodvillage.com. Blessings to you for love and light.